There wasn't a state that wasn't affected by the rash of bombings. Many of the devices were these, these simple bottles filled with gasoline with a rag stuck in the neck. The reality was they often didn't ignite. Terry continued to update me. The New York Collective was now planning to follow their first actions with several simultaneous ones. The plan was to demonstrate not just the willingness to take up arms, but the existence of an organization extensive enough to carry out several organized attacks at the same time. The collective was in the process of picking the targets and assigning work. There would be another meeting tomorrow where I would get to meet the whole group. In the meantime, if I was sure I was ready to join the group, we would proceed downtown to the temporary apartment where I would meet the other people in the collective's leadership group, which I would join. Was I sure I wanted to join? Two things I was sure about. Uppermost, I was sure that I wanted to be with Terry. It never occurred to me that I could be outside of the organization and still have a relationship with him. True commitment to the fight for equality and justice was so interwoven into our passion that it was unthinkable to separate the two. I was also sure that I wanted access to the inner workings of the organization. The intensity of the New York Collective confirmed my suspicions that Seattle must have been seen as a non-important arena of action. I was ready to embrace the legal aspects of the Collective's work. I had been ready since Fred Hampton was murdered. Democracy was failing to bring about change. A decisive moment in history defined by wars of national liberation was upon us. We too had to look to a more Leninist version of change, a change that would be led by those who were willing to take the risk. Even if we were in the minority, we were leading in the interest of the majority. We would do it alone if necessary, Terry and many others had said. I didn't question the moral absolutism of the sentiment. The final threads holding me to the idea of participatory democracy had frayed and broken. I had come to agree with Fanon. Nonviolence was a luxury of the middle class of whites in the contention for power. All around the world, people were fighting to gain control of their lives. We would have to as well. There was no way to stop the destructive system except meeting its violence with violence as the Vietnamese had been forced to do. I had come to accept that, as Mao said in his little red books of quotations, political power did ultimately grow from the barrel of a gun. I had been uncomfortable with street fighting because it seemed so easily reduced to a macho contest of egos rather than a political engagement with specific goals. Violent clashes and public protests would not lead to insurrection here, I thought, because the country was too large with too few willing to join the barricades. Instead, it just led to arrests, bashed heads, and the burdens of bail and time spent in court. Likewise, the flinging around of violent rhetoric for its own sake seemed irresponsible and purposeless, if not repulsive. If, however, we were building a clandestine fighting force that could learn over the long run how to fight, then that made sense to me, and I wanted to be a warrior in that force. The U.S. government had attacked popular governments in Guatemala, Iran, and Indonesia. The CIA had attempted to assassinate Fidel Castro in Cuba, and was suspected and later proven to have been behind the assassinations of Patrice Lumumba in the Congo, and Samora Michelle in Mozambique a few years later. Whether they used violence or covert actions, the system would stop at nothing to defend itself. Weren't the deaths of Malcolm X, the Kennedys, King, and Fred Hampton, and the attempted murder of Reese Tiarina evidence that they were possibly already using clandestine violence at home, whether carried out directly or through the encouragement of others? Likewise, the backlash against civil rights seemed to be increasing every month. Attacks on busing had brought many attempts at school integration to a standstill in the North. We needed to learn how to defend ourselves and others, how to operate in secret, how to protect people, and eventually how to strike out to rid ourselves of such a violent system. 
Finally, my fascination with technology pulled me towards the opportunity to finally learn all this military, how all this military stuff worked. How and why did Molotov cocktails ignite? It seemed like those with the scientific and technical knowledge were calling the shots. If we had to take up arms, I wanted to learn about them. Men should not have exclusive possession of this knowledge. Yes, I wanted to say, I said. So that's an example of my thinking at the time. And the way that I wrote the book, I didn't editorialize while I was, you know, about my thinking while I was writing it. Um, I think it's pretty clear if you read the whole book what I think now, but I didn't interject a lot while I was writing it because I was really trying to create the frame of mind that I was in at that time and what were the factors influencing me and making me think in this particular way. Um, there's certain dangers of that. Obviously, I'm going to be quoted out of context a lot. Um, but but I, I think that's the only way to write honest political memoirs. So um, let's see. Are there any questions? Do people want to ask anything more? Should I read more? Do you want me to read more from the same selection? 